Welcome to Plant Systematics. This is a course in which you're going to learn terms like stamen and pistil so that you never find yourself in the situation of this poor guy here where you don't know which bathroom to use. Yes, it's a course on plants and plant nomenclature and plant identification, and I hope we have a good time with it this year. Well, what are the what is a plant and why should we study plant systematics? Well, of course, you know that plants are photosynthetic organisms. They have chlorophyll. Which are maintained in chloroplasts. They have cell walls and the cell walls are composed of cellulose. And those cell walls, of course, are outside the plasma membrane. Plants are sedentary, although sometimes they do move a little bit. So here's a sensitive plant, and that is happening in approximately real time. Someone has touched the end of that leaflet and it's closing up. If you haven't seen sensitive plants, they're really pretty cool and you should try to find one to take a look at and have that experience yourself. So for the most part, they are sedentary. At least we mean by that that they are rooted in the ground. One of the more technical characteristics of the plants that you probably haven't encountered before are that they have spores. A spore is a unicellular structure. And it's a reproductive cell. It's kind of a unicellular reproductive cell. These are not gametes. So there are reproductive cells which are not gametes in plants. And the spores are not mobile. which means they have no flagella. Now, in many plants, the sperm don't have flagella either, but we'll come to that later on. So we need to look a little bit more closely at what these things spores are and how they fit into the life cycle. And to do that, we're going to take a look at the life cycle. And so we're going to draw the life cycle of a basic plant here. And we're going to start drawing that life cycle by drawing a horizontal line on the screen. And what we're going to put on the top and the bottom of those lines is we're going to put the different parts of the life cycle. That is, there is a part of the life cycle that's haploid. And we're going to draw that here on the top of this screen, up top of the line. And there's a part of the life cycle that's diploid. And we're going to draw that here below the line. So you know this in your own life cycles that you have haploid and diploid portions too. But in human life cycles, the haploid portion is only restricted to the gametes. So that's the only haploid cells we have. Now it's quite a bit different in plants, and we're going to about to see. They have a lot of other parts of their life cycle, a lot of much larger part of their life cycle, uh, which is haploid. Whoops. Let's go back. So there are two processes now that link the haploid and the diploid portions of the life cycle. Let's do fertilization over here on the right first. So fertilization is going to take the sperm and the egg. We can write them up there. And it's going to unite those two things, those two cells, and it's going to produce a zygote. That's all pretty familiar to you. Over on the other side, we have another process over here that takes us from diploid to haploid, and that is meiosis. 
and meiosis is what produces our spores. So there are spores, they're unicellular, they have no flagella, they're haploid, and they are going to divide to produce a multicellular organism. So we have in plants, in this haploid portion of the life cycle, a multicellular organism. Now I'm going to put those words multicellular organism in parentheses because there is an official name for this type of organism and that organism is called the gamete bearing plant, the gamete bearer or the, just the gamete bearer, gamete plant. So it is called the gamete, gametophyte. And the gametophyte is going to produce the egg and the sperm. So gamete here means marriage, and phyte means plant. These are Greek words, but they have good English meanings. So the gametophyte is the marriage plant. It produces the egg and the sperm. So it's given rise to the two cells that are going to unite in marriage, and <clears throat> that marriage is called fertilization. Now, I said that there were processes that gave rise, that our spores went through in order to produce the gametophyte, and that process is mitosis. So there's a mitotic process that the plants go through, the spores go through, to produce the gametophyte, a multicellular organism, often very, very small, but still a multicellular organism, and that gametophyte will produce our egg and our sperm, unite in fertilization to produce the zygote. Well, what happens to the zygote? I think you know already that that's going to undergo mitosis to produce another multicellular organism. And that multicellular organism is called the sporophyte. Again, we have that word phyte, meaning plant. And we have the word spore, and we see that word again now. Now, I haven't told you what spore means. It's another Greek word. We've used it in English so long that we think of it as an English word, but it really does have a meaning in Greek, and it means seed. Now, these are not the seeds that you're used to planting in your garden. It's not that kind of seed. <clears throat> it's the seed in kind of the biblical sense of that term. You know that sometimes the Bible will speak of the um, male seed, and how that male seed is, the, in that case, the sperm, so it's a reproductive cell. So it's seed in that term of a reproductive cell. And we see it over here, the spore, the reproductive cell, undergoing mitosis to produce our gametophyte. Well, our sporophyte is going to produce our spores, but it's going to do them, it's going to maintain those spores in a kind of a box. And that box is called a sporangium. And within that sporangium, that's where meiosis occurs, and meiosis produces the spores. Angium means box. So literally, sporangium means a spore box. So that's our life cycle, and that's the life cycle we're going to be working with all semester. We're going to make it a little more complex as we go on, but this is the basic idea. We have some spores being produced, unicellular reproductive structures, they undergo mitosis 
to produce a multicellular organism, the gametophyte. That gametophyte produces our sex cells, the egg and the sperm. They unite in fertilization. Fertilization produces now a diploid organism, the first cell of which is the zygote. The zygote then undergoes mitosis. to produce our sporophyte, another multicellular organism that produces, or we could say is a part of the sporophyte, is the sporangium. It's a box, a container in which meiosis occurs and spores are produced in that box. So that's our basic life cycle of plants that we'll work with all semester. So why is it in the study to Important to study plants? Well, of course, they produce oxygen. They're the primary producers. All life on Earth depends on them. They are economically important in lots of ways. Everything we eat is either from a plant or it has <coughs> eaten a plant. So if you eat meat, um, those meat eaters that we then eat, I mean, sorry, those plant eaters that we have eaten have eaten plants. There's wood and fibers and so much material is built out of wood. There are medicinal plants, incredibly important. Many of our drugs are initially derived from medicinal plants, and then there are culinary spices, all kinds of important reasons. But there are also other really important reasons that have to do with um, uh, maintaining life on Earth. Well, we're doing systematics this semester, not studying all aspects of plants, but understanding plant systematics. And there's two really important functions of plant systematics. One of that, one of those functions is the naming of plants. That is creating a taxonomy. A taxonomy, well, first of all, nomi, that kind of sounds like name. And in fact, that root means name. And tax means an arrangement. So a taxonomy is a named arrangement. So taxonomy is the science of providing a name for every organism. And that's one of the things that we'll spend a lot of time on this semester is understanding how naming works. It's a very formal system, very legalistic, and extremely important. Because without namings, we couldn't talk about things or agree with what they are. We'll see more about why it's so important as we go on. The second really important <clears throat> function of systematics is uncovering the evolutionary relationships. So the evolutionary history or the evolutionary relationships of organisms. And we'll talk a good deal this semester about the history of how we have thought about evolutionary relationships, what we've done in the past, and what we're doing now. What we get when we study evolutionary relationships is we get some kind of a phylogeny. And so here is an example of a phylogeny. And we are going to try to find our organisms that we're going to be studying this semester, semester in this phylogeny. First of all, let's notice that there are two types of main types of organisms here. There are the prokaryotic organisms. Those that lack a true nucleus. And here are the eukaryotic organisms. Now, of course, we're studying mainly eukaryotic organisms this semester. When we look for our, the plants we're going to be working on, we come over here. To this region, and we find the green plants. And when we look down here to these little black lines on the lines, we see that we have a process 
indicated. So the thing, the characteristic that holds all of these green plants together is the possession of a chloroplast, a green chloroplast, a chloroplast that contains the normal types of chlorophyll that you've probably learned about in other classes. Well, let's look at that process of how that green chloroplast came about. And that has come about through a process of endosymbiosis. Now, this endosymbiosis, really we could call it the endosymbiotic theory, <clears throat> but there's an incredible amount of evidence for it now. So we kind of think that this is really the way things happened. But still, let's look back in time a little bit to the person who invented this theory, and that was a very famous female scientist, Dr. Lynn Margulis. And she developed what was called the endosymbiotic theory. Now, I'm not going to walk through all the evidence for the endosymbiotic theory. That's really a topic for cell biology. But I'm going to explain a little bit about what the word endosymbiosis means and a little bit about how we think it took place. That is not the evidence, but kind of the story that's resulted from those evidence, that evidence. So endo means inside. Sim means with. You can also think about it as together. Bio means life. And this SIS ending indicates that it's a process. So again, Greek again, with life inside a process. So what's that all referring to? Well, it's referring to a process that took place a process of endosymbiosis. So how that has happened is here we have an ancestral photosynthetic bacterium. And I'm going to outline that bacterium here in dark blue. That's indicating the cell membrane of that bacterium. And specifically, the blue is going to mean the chemical composition of the bacterium. There is a cell wall or a cell membrane around the other cell that's involved in this, and I'm going to outline that in red, and it's got a different chemical composition. And so that is going to be in red, and that's the chemical composition. Of this cell, and we're going to call this a proto-eukaryotic cell. Proto mean before, proto-eukaryotic. And so that cell has no organelles. Specifically, no chloroplasts. Now what's happening then is that we get this ancestral bacterium being engulfed by the protokaryotic cell in the process of Endo, endocytosis. So it's taken in. 
Now, in most cases, that's happening because the proto-eukaryotic cell is eating the bacterium. It's using it as a food source. But there were mistakes that were made. And those mistakes resulted in this proto-eukaryotic cell incorporating the bacteria as an organelle. So it becomes an organelle over long periods of time. Now when I say over long periods of time, that doesn't mean that a single bacterium gets incorporated in there and it stays there over long periods of time. It means that there are mistakes that happened and they were very rare mistakes and eventually they started to be incorporated and maybe other mutations took place, other mistakes took place <clears throat> that allowed the bacterium to stay inside the cell instead of being digested for a longer period of time until what we end up with then is here's the photosynthetic eukaryotic cell and I'm trying to outline there that membrane again. And it's got the same chemical composition here as our original membrane. And if we looked inside at these now organelles, and we looked at the chemical composition of their membranes, we would see that they have the same chemical composition as the bacterium. So that's the process, and one of the lines of evidence that we have that we are pretty sure that this is correct is these different chemical compositions of the organelle and of the outer membrane, the outer plasma membrane of our eukaryotic cells. Another thing you know about is that the organelles have circular DNA, the bacteria have circular DNA, and the eukaryotic cells have <coughs> linear chromosomes that have histones in them. The chloroplasts have no histones. The bacteria have no histones. So there's a lot of evidence that suggests this is how the green chloroplasts came about. And that's what we saw in our phylogeny here, giving rise to our green plants. Now in the next slide, we're going to take this lineage here, this line here, and we're going to split it up. So there is the green plast chloroplast down here at the base. So this line here going up is the same as that one line from our last, our last phylogenetic tree. So we've expanded that. So we're going to find our plants here in this other line. Now before we do that, we want to <clears throat> look at a term. And look, see what that term means here. And that term is monophyletic. This is a term we're going to be concerned with a lot this semester. Mono means one. Philo means tribe. And our idea here is that we have a single tribe, a single evolutionary event that gives rise to a group of organisms. Let's think about how we could find monophyletic groups here because it's easier to understand monophyletic when we have a bunch of examples. So let's take a little scissors. My scissors don't look very much like scissors. They look something like tin snips. So there's my scissors and we're going to make a cut on one of these lines. If we can then 
when we've made that cut, if we can lift off a group, a group of taxa, a group of organisms like this, that is a monophyletic group. So we can think of these monophyletic groups of as when we have a phylogenetic tree, if we can make one cut on the tree and we can lift off a group, then it is a monophyletic group. There is a formal definition from monophyletic, which I am not going to give you. You can look it up in your book. It is quite difficult to understand. I wanted to give you an intuitive feel for what a monophyletic group is because you're going to be needing this term and needing to be able to interpret phylogenetic trees all during the semester. Let us look at a group which is not monophyletic. So let's say we had a group that included the liverworts and the mosses and that this is our phylogenetic tree. How many cuts would we have to make on this tree to get off, to lift off these two taxa together, liverworts and mosses? Well, we would have to make a cut here. And we would have to make a cut here. We would have to make two cuts. So that is not a monophyletic group. We could not come down here right you might think well we'll just come down here and we'll make a cut there but we can't do that because we would get three groups off we would get mosses liverworts and hornworts and anyway you're cutting three lines down there not just one a monophyletic group always has to be cut just one line off So we can find some other monophyletic groups here. Here is another monophyletic group. Here is another monophyletic group. And you can find them on all kinds of other trees. So what is our group that we're going to be working with today, this, this semester? Well, we are going to be working with everything from here on out. This is our group. It is a monophyletic group. There's our big scissors here cutting it off. And this group then is called, in technical terms, the tracheophytes. Trachea just means tube, so it's vascu the vascular plants. That is what we are studying this semester, the vascular plants. And there it is on a monophyletic group. Well, let's move on from our introductory material on our phylogeny and the groups that we're studying and the life cycles to look at what some of the goals of plant systematics are. One of the most important goals, and one we're going to spend a lot of time on, is the goal of nomenclature providing a name for every group of plants. This is very legalistic, as I've said. There are very formal rules. And they are laid down in a document, which is that International Code for the Nomenclature of Algae, Fungi, and Plants. That code is <clears throat> revised every six years, and we'll talk more about that as we get into nomenclature. So nomenclature is an extremely important function of systematics, naming plants. Second big group um, goal is uh, classification. So producing a system of classification. So that is the arrangement of plants into groups. Those groups should have common characteristics. 
all modern groups of organisms, modern groups of plants, but all other organisms too, are monophyletic. So all groups should be monophyletic. Now, this has not always been the case. It's only been in the last 30 years that there has been a widespread consensus in science that we should have monophyletic groups in our classification. And when you notice, back a couple slides, I circled a group that we're going to be working with now, and I showed you that it's monophyletic, a group that we're going to be working with in this class. We are going to talk about the history of classification and why people think that group should be monophyletic, because as I say, it has not always been so. Well, since we're talking about classifications, let's look at some of the um, ranks or the levels of classification. And I'm sure you know this from other classes. We go down from the division down to the species level and even below the species level, as we'll see in the next slide. The division is called the phylum in zoology. <clears throat> so in botany, it's called division. It's called phylum. It's the same level in the hierarchy. And then we go down to species. So these are groups within groups. Within each species, I'm sorry, within each genus, there are multiple species. Within each genus, there are multiple families. Within each family, there are multiple genera, etc. I'm not sure I've said that correctly all the way through, but I think you get my idea here. <clears throat> As we go up, each level includes multiple ones at the lower level. Some of these levels have formal endings to their names. That is, starting with the family level, we see in plants, the ending of every family name is going to end in A-C-E-A-E. -E. Now, <clears throat> there are different ways to pronounce this ending, mainly in different parts of the world. We live in the United States. We are going to pronounce it in the U.S. way, which is A-C-E. So here is the family of lilies, the lily A-C-E. If we were talking about the family that contains magnolias, we would see the Magnoliaceae. This is one of the main levels we are going to be concerned with in this class. The other main level is the generic level. And the generic level, there is no standard ending. So no standard way in which generic names end. At the species level, there are two names, and this is called two named nomenclature, binomial. Binomial nomenclature. We'll say more about that later. Above the family, in this class, we might encounter some <clears throat> orders, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on them. They end in the <clears throat> standardized ending ALES, which we are going to pronounce ALES. Lily ALES, Magnolia ALES, Zingiber ALES, <clears throat> etc. Well, this is a very small um, part of the hierarchy, of the taxonomic hierarchy. In the next slide, we're going to expand that a, look, a little bit <clears throat> and just see that there are many other levels in this hierarchy. Here we are as species here, and we can see that going down from species, there are subspecies and varieties. You might see some names like this with SPP or VAR after the binomial name. Going up from species, between species and genus, we have subsections of the genus or subgenus and sections of the genus. Between family and genus, we have subfamilies, tribes, and subtribes. And now, once we get above genus, we start to see standardized endings on these. 
<clears throat> you might see some of these this semester, but the main ones we are going to be working with, the main ending we are going to be working with is this family ending ACE. So when you see a <clears throat> name that ends in ACE, like Aster ACE, the sunflower family, you know that is at the family level of the hierarchy. If you do see things that end in Ailes, you will see the Aster Ailes here um, at the level of order. In addition to classification, we have description. <clears throat> There's two parts to description. We want to assign features to the taxa that we are describing. That is basically write descriptions of them when those descriptions are used in various ways. And also we want to inventory the world's flora to be able to make a list of the plants that occur in various regions of the world. These inventories are usually done regionally. There is no yet completely world flora, but there are certainly very large regional floras. There is a regional flora for the United States or even for North America that is being completed. We're going to take a look in the next slide at these two different features, actually in the next two slides, characters and character states and floristics, floras of the different regions. So characters and character states, it's very simple. A feature, a character is just a feature of an organism, for instance, flower color, and then the character states, the states of that character would be things in case of flower color like white, yellow, red, etc. The various states that a character has. Floras, and here is an example of a flora. This is a flora of the northeastern region of the United States. It is three volumes. It's originally written by Britton and Brown. Here's a cover of the paperback version of it. And if we looked inside that floor, we would see a number of things. We would see um, drawings of the different plants, not always, but many times. There would be an accepted name for each plant. We'll talk more about what that means coming up. There would be other names down here which are non-accepted names. And these non-accepted names are called synonyms. We'll talk a lot about synonyms in the next few weeks. So other people have named this plant besides the authors of this, and they have given it different names, and these authors, Britton and Brown, are saying we do not agree with these other names for this plant. Then there is a description. And that description is usually using lots of technical terms, as you can see. And after that, there is sometimes some little notes about distribution and flowering times. There'll be other things in the flaws, but this listing of plants with descriptions of the plants, there'll also be identification guides, which we're going to talk about next in these flaws. They are then created for different regions of the United States. As I say, this one is for the northeastern United States and adjacent Canada. <coughs> there is a flaw for the southeastern United States now. It's been prepared out of a research site at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. That is the herbarium. We'll talk about 
what herbarium is very shortly. It's basically a scientific collection of plants. This is the regions that the flora covers. And um, there is a new edition that's just come out recently in October. And I will tell you more about that where you can get a copy of the floor. It's all free in this case. Unfortunately, the, this floor does not yet contain illustrations. My understanding is they intend to add them, but it's a tremendous amount of work producing these floras, and uh, they haven't gotten to that yet. Okay, identification. I said that there, within these floras, there is some means of identifying a plant. So identifying an unknown plant. Let's say you've got a plant sitting there in your hand, and you want to know what it is. You can go to a flora of your region and use the tools that they have in there. And those tools are keys. So a key is the mechanisms of identifying the unknown plants. Not the only one, but it's one of them and one of the main ones. We'll talk about more of them in just a minute. Identifications also depend on these herbaria. The herbaria are the collections of dried, identified plants. These are reference collections. Essentially, a herbarium is a plant museum. But it's a funny plant museum. Because it consists of dried plants, dead plants, which have been flattened, you know, pressed. They've been compressed down so they're completely flat, dried, glued onto sheets of paper, and placed into cabinets. And they can be hundreds of these cabinets with thousands, hundreds of thousands, in many cases, of these plant specimens. The herbaria then are used as reference collections for a number of different purposes. The flora of the southeastern states would not have been possible unless there was, except for the herbaria, except for the dried plant collections in the herbaria. As I say, we'll talk more about these as we go along. So a key. How do we make a key work? Well, keys are used to identify unknown taxa. We've mentioned them a little bit before. And we'll look at them in the next slide in more detail. We can also compare our unknown, the plant that we've got there in our hands, to a photograph or an illustration that we find on the web if we know that we're looking at a valid site that's got good identifications on it. We can compare it to a specimen in a herbarium. That's not available to most of us, but for some people who are living in an area where there's a herbarium and they have access to the herbarium, that's a very good method because the specimen in the herbarium have had their identifications verified. Or an image, perhaps, again, an image that's stored in a herbarium. We can ask an expert about how to identify the plant, but you'll often find that if you ask an expert too many questions, like more than once every four or five months, they're going to get kind of annoyed because they've got better things to do than identify your plants for you. So it's a really great way to do it if you know someone who doesn't mind helping you identify plants, but it's not a great way overall. Now, there's new methods of doing identifications. For instance, iNaturalist, and we'll do some work with iNaturalist late in the semester to learn how we can use them. Uh, and, and then there are automated identification tools to help get us an identification. They are, they are not, these tools are not completely accurate, but they give us a good shot at getting in a first pass at identification. So how about a key? What's a key and how do we use it? Well, keys are always dichotomous. D-I-C-H means to, and tomi means to cut. So uh, keys are dichotomous. They are cut in two, which means that there are always two choices at any one level. So we're going to look at this first level first. We're going to make a choice between number one and number one prime, stamens fused at base or stamens not fused at base. And as we move through the key, we're always going to have two choices. That is what makes it a dichotomous key. There's two types of keys that in some ways are very similar, but they're laid out on the page differently. This key that we're looking here is called a bracket key. It is called a bracket key because there's these implied little brackets here. So look, there's a bracket at that level. This one is at that same level. 
this bracket is pushed into here so that the couplets of the key, the couplets means every two leads is called a couplet, the couplets go on like that. They're being pushed inwards or they're at this outer stage. They're inwards or they're at the outer stage. And it goes on like that. So to use a bracket key, you make your first choice. And let's say that we made this choice. Stamen's not fused at the base. And then there should be over here a number two saying go on to number two. Go to number two and let's say we say fertile stamen six. And there should be a choice over here that says go on to number three. And we continue on like that, working through the key until we get to our final answer. This is a very short, short key. You can sometimes go through a hundred of these couplets. A hundred would be a lot, but it's not impossible to go through very many of these couplets in order to get an answer. So when you work through this kind of keys, these bracket keys, you might notice that it's very hard to work backwards. Let's say you get down here, a stamen's not strongly winged at the base, and you get the genus Mullia. And now you go and you look at a description of Mullia, and you find it doesn't match your plant. Or you look at an image of it, and you say it doesn't make your plant, match your plant. So you need to go backwards. Now, in this case, we know that we came from up here, from number two, because it's only a three-part key. But let's say we're on, you know, question number 46 here. And we came from question number 22. How do we know we came from question 22 if we don't remember it? It would be very hard to back up in this kind of a key. And so the big disadvantage of these kinds of bracket keys is that it's very hard to back up in them. Now, unfortunately, you're going to be using a bracket key for much of the semester. And we have found a way to help you with this problem of backing up. And we'll talk about that as you get into the lab. Now, why would anyone want to use a bracket key if they've got these big problems that it's so hard to back up? The other type of key we're going to see doesn't have this problem. Well, <clears throat> publishers really liked bracket keys because a lot of the page is taken up with text. That is, there isn't a lot of blank space over here on this side of the page. When we look at the other type of key, this type of key is called an indented key, and we look over here at the side of the page, and let's say we were to use a much longer key and we get, you know, down not to just question 11, but we get down to question 40, you know, we're over here someplace in the key. And we've got all kinds of blank space over here next to them. Publishers really didn't like that very well. They didn't like producing lots of blank pages. And so a publisher really liked the bracket keys. Indented keys, however, are much easier to use. Let's look at how you would do that. Here we are, take a choice between one and one prime here. Now, they're not right next to each other, but as soon as we say, ah, uh, I'm going to choose option number one, all of the possibilities for option number one are right there, right under number one. So if we go then down to number two here from number one, then we have choices of two number twos, and we say we take this one here, over inferior, all of the choices for that one are here, right immediately under it. So if we get down here, and we find that we keyed our genus out to homodorum, and we <clears throat> look at the description, and it's not homodorum, we say, well, how did we get there to 8? Well, we got there from 7. We, maybe we choose the other way in 7, but remember, maybe it's not dilatherous either. Maybe that's wrong also. How did we get to seven? Well, we got there from two. So it's very easy in these kinds of indented keys to back up in them. And so the people who are using the keys really like indented keys a lot better than bracket keys. Well, another way of doing identifications is to use written descriptions. Unfortunately, these written descriptions take a lot of knowledge to read. I mean, look at this terminology. Apical leaflet, widely elliptic, usually petiolate, petiolol, petiolol, green, narrowly winged. I mean, it's just, and that's, that's a relatively easy to understand sentence compared to what some of these other ones are going to be down here. Um, here we have things uh, talking about the corolla lobes inclined to divergent and recurved relative to floral axis. I mean, what the heck does that mean? So it takes a lot of specialized knowledge to read these descriptions. 
by the end of the semester, you will be able to read these descriptions reasonably well. Even then, you're going to have to look up certain terms, like this term divergence, you might have to look up. But you will know many of the other terms by the end of the semester. Still, written descriptions are not a great way of making your identifications. They're very difficult to use. Specimen com comparison. Well, here's our herbarium specimens. So these are dried parts of the plants, sometimes whole plants. If they're a small plant, like over here, we can put the whole plant there. If it's a big plant, like this cactus, we can't get the whole plant in, and so we put parts of the plants on the sheet. We put specific kind of information on it that we'll talk about later on these labels. One of the things that's on the labels is the name of the plant. And they are um, dried and they're put in cabinets in herbaria, dried plant collections. And they're arranged in specific ways in there so that you can find the plant you're looking for. And let's say you've got a plant in your hand and you go into a herbarium if you have access to it and you can consult these herbaria specimens and try to figure out if it is that specimen. Now, you actually need an identification first of your plant before you can preferably use an herbarium. But so this, so this idea of specimen comparison really only works very well to confirm your identification. And it's not available to everybody. Most herbaria are not open to the general public. They're very valuable plant collections, and they're only open to people who have shown that they know how to use them. Image comparison is something you can do on the internet. You can take your plant, holding it in your hand there, and you open up a web browser and you start to look for pictures that look like that. Again, it's much easier to do this if you have some idea of what your plant is. So again, this will help you confirm So you're looking at confirmation or disconfirmation or saying, oh, or saying that that's wrong. So you can sometimes tell that you've got the wrong idea by looking at the pictures of plants <coughs> with, of that name that you think yours is. Ask an expert we've talked out about already. Um, you've got to find one and then you've got to convince them that you're not going to annoy them very much and iNaturalist. I really encourage you to take a look at iNaturalist even now. It's a great website. You can post pictures there. It's got automated identifications tools and a community of other naturalists who are interested in correct identifications and the distribution of plants and animals also. It works not just for plants but for animals, fungi, all kinds of different organisms. Really any kind of organism that you can get a good picture of can be on iNaturalist. We will work with it a little bit later in the semester. So that's identification. Our last goal is phylogeny, that is determining the evolutionary relationships. We've already seen some phylogenies when we looked at those, those phylogenetic trees to determine the taxa that we're going to be working on. We use mainly DNA evidence these days but also, in some cases, morphology. Morphology, the form of the plant, has usually the most typical way of using or of constructing phylogenies has been morphology, the most typical way in the past. And then in the last, oh, 25 years or so, DNA evidence has really come to the fore, and that is the predominant way now. And so all of these trees that we're going to see, like this one, have been the result of working with DNA evidence. So this is a phylogenetic tree. And as I say, most of the evidence, um, most of the trees that are constructed now are constructed from DNA evidence, and a large part of the time that a systematist spends is in reconstructing these kinds of trees. So why study plant systematics? Well, it really is a foundational subject in biology. This idea of naming things is really important. If we don't know what something's name is, we can't really do any work on it. I mean, let's just suppose that you have people doing genetic work on this little fry that they found. And we've got one lab 
doing the work on it and they say, ah, oh, we got a fly here and we're doing lots of work on it and we've done all this molecular work and we found all these genes and do these other things on it and somebody else goes down and they grab another fly in another lab, let's say in Texas, and they start doing molecular work on it and they say, oh, well, we can't verify any of those things that you found in your fly. And it's because they got different species of flies. And without some way of knowing that they're really dealing with exactly the same thing, with exactly the same species, sometimes with the same subspecies, all the molecular work that we see being done would have no basis. So that, how we know we've got the same species is because of systematics. Because we have people out there naming things and making sure that the names are applied correctly. So it really is an integrative science that is necessary for all the other sciences. We work with economically important plants many times, and those many times are important in conservation. <coughs> so, again, if you are a smuggler and you're bringing a plant into the country illegally, and this happens much too often, I'm afraid, and they catch you at the border, well, there's laws about bringing certain plants into the country. How does that officer at the border know that this person is bringing one of the protected plants? Of course, the smuggler is saying, oh no, that's not that species, this is a different species that is not protected, and so the officer has to know how to make correct identifications of the plants so that they will know whether the plant being smuggled in is really a protected plant or it's just a, not, you know, a very common, perhaps even a weed. Actually, even bringing weeds in is not a good idea. No. But at least they're not protected. So all of the treaties on, it, on international treaties on endangered and protected plants all depend very strongly on plant systematics, on the naming of plants. The other reason that I think that we should study plant systematics, and especially my approach to plant systematics, is it's really going to show us how science is really done. How science is not done is it is not done by a few really smart scientists going out there and finding out the truth about the world by a few experiments. It's really done by scientists going out there and doing work on the natural environment, and then arguing over what that work means, and eventually coming to some kind of conclusion and presenting that data for other people to look at. And we're going to see that process of arguing over data, even arguing over very fundamental principles, we're going to see that in a very real and tangible way when we study the history of plant systematics. Biologists have been arguing over what the best way to name organisms is for many years. Not the Linnaean naming. Linnaean naming has been agree agreed on for hundreds of years. I mean the classification and the phylogenetic and the way we treat phylogenies. The fact that we should always have monophyletic groups has not been something that has been universally true. It's only something that has been accepted to be true in the last 25 years. And we're going to look at why that is. Well, all of these things are great and they are important reasons for studying plant systematics. But there is one other reason, and that is plants really are a lot of fun and they are really cool. And I hope by the end of the semester you agree with me on that.